that's good, thank you. St. Ambrose said in medieval Latin, si fueris Ramai Romano vivito more, but mi dispiace che io non parlo italiano, so I'm afraid I have to speak in English even though I'm in Rome. But uh, many thanks for the invitation, it's greatly appreciated, Francesca and, and everybody. Um, can we extrapolate the data from cannabidiol? So I'm going to present to you some information about cannabidiol. I think the simple answer is I don't know. So if anybody wishes to stop listening now, that's uh, okay. Um, but let's see where this takes us. And the outline of my talk is I'm, I'm going to look at several elements of um, the information we have available on cannabidiol. Firstly, I'm gonna look at the pharmacology, which seems relevant to PCDH19, firstly, from the point of view of the anti-seizure pharmacology, and secondly, from the point of view of cognition, cognitive function. There is some anecdote out there. We, I'll, I'll cover the anecdote. We have a very substantial open-label expanded access program in the United States. I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll perhaps I'm gonna touch on some proposed mechanisms of action where there might be overlap between the mechanisms we think might be relevant to PCDH19 um, and to cannabidiol, and tell you about the progress of our very substantial randomized controlled trials program. So let's start with the anti-seizure pharmacology. Uh, it's fairly conventional. Um, I'm wondering, do I have a, no, I don't. Oh, yes, here, yeah. So we start with an in vitro model of cultured hippocampal slices in artificial CSF, and you can see from this heat map that on the left-hand side of each image, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, a magnesium-free medium, and on the right-hand side, a four amino pyridine added to the medium, both produce a status epilepticus type of continuing um, seizure-like electrical activity across the hippocampal sheets. And on the right-hand side of each sheet, those heat maps are substantially reduced. If you wish to quantify that, you can do so um, um, here, and you can see that that effect of cannabidiol in this in vitro model is uh, pan-hippocampal. It's not restricted to one region of the hippocampus, but we have dentate gyrus and CA1 and CA3, all of which show a significant reduction in um, seizure-like activity. Because of that, and we don't only do this model with um, CBD, this is a model we apply to a range of non-psychoactive cannabinoids, but I'm concentrating on CBD today. We then move into a whole series of standard in vivo models that you can see here. Uh, we look at ma maximal electroshock at auditory or audiogenic seizures at uh, pentylene tetrazol, PTZ, pilocarpine induced seizure, which we've just heard about earlier on, which we're regarding in our model as more temporal lobe epilepsy rather than status, uh, and, in, as, and in penicillin-induced seizures. And in all of those models, we administer the cannabidiol uh, on its own and with other uh, established anti-epileptic drugs in order to, det to determine in models whether there might be a negative or a positive pharmacodynamic interaction. And we've done that with val valproic acid, phenobarbital, and ethosuximide. And I, I'm not gonna run through all the models, I'll just show you some examples. Um, they're actually all positive, some, some more than others, and interestingly, some at slightly different dose doses. Uh, and I think the dose question is one we're going to come back to. Here's um, the audiogenic model. Uh, in, as many of you will know, this is the only animal model in which levetiracetam was positive, that's negative in all the others. So the relevance, uh, more or less negative in all the others. Um, so the relevance of the animal models has to be something one takes with a, a degree of um, uh, skepticism possibly. However, uh, this is what we see in the audiogenic model. Uh, left hand ch bar is wild running, then um, clinic convulsions, tonic convulsions and mortality on the right. And you can see that at, at the dose levels tested here, up at 100 and 200 milligrams per kilogram given IP, the CBD was effective, and here's a PTZ model, where similarly we're seeing effectiveness at a slightly lower dose, at 100 mg per kg here, both on seizure severity and mortality, and a tonic clinic, the percentage of animals experiencing tonic clinic convulsions. When, when adding um, CBD to either 
valproic acid on the left-hand side or ethosuximide on the right-hand side, we are very pleased that we saw no negative interactions, so that one did not apparently interfere with the effectiveness of the other. Uh, we did see some positive additive uh, and close to synergistic interaction, particularly with valproic acid. I put in red at the bottom of the slide, um, it's notable in the animal models with valparate as you get towards effective dose levels uh, and with ethosuximide and phenobarbital and others, that you get significant motor impairment of the animals. Uh, they're simply less able to, be, uh, to move normally. Uh, and we did see that uh, with the um, uh, established anti-epileptics. We do not see that with um, CBD. Interestingly, um, we, we also looked at um, a series of epilepsy-associated genes, looking at gene expression of the epilepsy-associated genes. I'm going to show you four. Uh, and the first um, graph really mirrors what's going to happen in the next three. But what we see here is that um, in the normal animal, we do not see CFOS expression to any degree. The animal challenged with pentaline tetrazol, who developed seizures, uh, has a, a great increase in the expression of CFOS. If challenged with CBDV alone, this is CBDV, a very close cousin of CBD, but actually we could put CBD in there as well. When challenged with CBD or CBDV alone, there is no increased CFOS expression. In the uh, epileptic animal treated with PTZ and with CBD, a big reduction in expression of CFOS. And the same pattern is seen with a number of other epilepsy-associated genes, ERG1, uh, ARC, and CCL4. But we then went on to look um, at whether or not the response of the animals to CBD or CBDV uh, in any way correlated with that change in gene expression, and it did. The red bar are the animals who responded, which is a seizure severity of less than three on the same scale we were hearing about earlier on, and the blue bar is the animals who did not respond. So we have a genetic biomarker for response, uh, which leaves us in a difficult chicken and egg um, situation of whether or not the reduction in gene expression is a response to the reduction in seizure severity, or whether the um, reduction in seizure severity is a response to the reduction in gene expression. Clearly, that's uh, of fairly fundamental importance. I mentioned safety, and we're still on the animal data here. Um, we use a, uh, we've more or less abandoned a rotor rod and moved to a one meter static beam, which I think is becoming relatively common, uh, and how far the animals progress across the beam, the speed with which they progress, and how many foot slips, how many failures they have on the way across are the measures of uh, motor impairment. And we can see here with CBD in this case, there are virtually no failures, even as we get up to um, 200, 100 and 200 milligrams per kilogram. With valproic acid, as you extend up to therapeutic doses in the animal models with ethosuximide and with phenobarbital, a majority of the animals uh, fail. Uh, and this is the distance traveled, uh, and the animals treated with CBD who have achieved efficacy travel the full meter. The animals treated with increasing doses of the existing anti-epileptic drugs don't. So we have a nice, again, a nice animal model, um, which in a sense may, may, may just address some aspects of risk benefit or, or efficacy versus um, side effects. So that's the, um, uh, the seizure pharmacology. Um, for various reasons, and, and we're gonna look at it a little bit later on, uh, and particularly with relevance to a, a number of um, genetic epilepsies, we also became interested in looking at the um, cognitive pharmacology of CBD. Uh, there is a literature going back 30 or, or, or more years uh, suggesting that CBD may have a number of antidepressant awakening alerting effects, and we've tried to put that on a more um, uh, contemporary basis. This is a novel object recognition in anim animals exposed to fencyclidine, PCP, uh, and that has been used in the past as a model of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. These animals lose social interaction, essentially. They become isolated, disinterested. Um, they don't pay any attention to a novel object when they're introduced to a novel object in an area to which they have become familiar. So this is um, the vehicle. The blue is the old object, the red is the novel object, and you can see that am animals are more interested in a novel object. They're curious, they're interested. 
PCP abolishes that interest, hence its use as a model of, um, of poor social interaction. Uh, CBD, uh, progressively at different doses up to 100 milligrams per kilogram, uh, returns that novel object recognition to normal uh, in the same way as the positive control risperidone in low dosage does. And I want to draw attention here to the dose levels that are proving efficacious, at least are proving positive, I should say, in this animal model. We're down at 2, 10, and 20 milligrams per kilogram, one-tenth of the exposure that was proving positive in the anti-seizure pharmacology models. And I think that's actually a very important lesson, that there's a kind of an assumption in conditions where seizures are associated with cognitive dysfunction that maybe if you treat one, the mechanism of action may be the same. Maybe, but in the words of the wise man, maybe not. Um, and I think this is something that needs to be thought about in clinical trials and in subsequent treatment. Um, this graph shows it with another cannabinoid, which I'm not talking about today, but we do have a follow-on compound already in the clinic, CBDV. Um, this simply reflects on the same data, so I won't, in the interest of time, dwell on that, but it confirms that uh, the um, um, abnormalities induced by PCP can be reversed. We've looked at Fragile X as well, using an fMRI1 knockout uh, in conjunction with Rafael Maldonado in Barcelona. And we've looked at both seizures and um, cognitive function in these animals. These experiments are still ongoing, so these are preliminary data. This looks at the seizures. So the left-hand three bars here are wild-type um, animals, and um, they're fine. Uh, and they're not affected either way by CBD or by CBDV. Here's the knockout, and you can see that seven out of the 10 knockouts uh, either experience mortality, uh, mortality on, on tonic convulsions, or wild running, a precursor to convulsive behavior in the animals. When treated with CBD, um, at 200 milligrams per kilogram, the anti-seizure dose, uh, you can see that those seizures are completely ablated, and with CBDV, more, more or less completely ablated. When we look, however, at, a, again, the novel object recognition paradigm, um, here's the wild type where the, um, the, the ratio between interest in the new versus interest in the old novel is 0 0.3 here. Um, that's fine. When we move to the knockout, that interest is completely ablated. The animals lose interest totally in, in novel objects, restored to a degree, not quite back to normal, by the high dose of CBD. Uh, and this is just confirmed uh, on the... Um, the side. These results do not reach statistical significance. The number of animals is still quite small and experiments are ongoing. So I'm presenting them only as, a, as an indication that there are signals that we're getting um, improvements in cognitive function in FMR1 knockouts. So let's move on to anecdotal uh, work. Um, the next bit on my, on my overview. Um, We've been working, looking at cannabinoids in epilepsy since about 2006, um, but really the situation changed dramatically in 2011-12 when, when the social media tidal wave, really, of, of parents and children in the United States using, using marijuana for treatment of refractory or treatment-resistant epile epilepsy disorders became uh, a very loud noise indeed. Um, and one of the consequences of that was this work from uh, Brenda Porter and Catherine Jacobson, San Francisco, who um, essentially um, asked questions of a number of parents who'd been using uh, uh, CBD-rich medical marijuana to treat uh, treatment-resistant seizures. And um, the children in the publication comprised primar primarily children with Dravet syndrome. Uh, incidentally, also one... Uh, with a PCDH19 mutation, um, and 15 cases in total. And you can see from the graph on the right-hand side that a, a very high proportion of the parents reported a very high level of response. Um, these were very, very heavily pretreated um, children, and it, it really led to, to an even greater demand, if that's the right word, for access to CBD for a number of these parents and children. I have 
been in contact with Catherine Jacobson actually over the last week. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get the specific data on whether the child with PCPH19 did well, but I hope to be able to do that in the coming weeks. She, um, or they listed um, side effects in their publication, and um, they listed side, de side, side effects that they attributed to the existing anti-epileptic drugs the children were on, and they also listed what they called side effects to CBD, and you'll see that many of those um, look as if they might reflect on cognitive function, on behavior, um, as in, in a positive way, and we'll come back to that. So now moving on to the consequence was that GW Pharmaceuticals, the company I'm chief medical officer of, um, agreed with a number of uh, pediatric neurologists in the United States to supply CBD for them to use in particularly severely affected, um, mainly children uh, with treatment-resistant epilepsies uh, under agreement with the FDA. So they're, they're all subject to what are called um, expanded access, an expanded access IND um, process. Um, the data I'm going to present is the data that was uh, presented or available at the American Academy of Neurology meeting uh, in earlier this year. There will be an update to these data presented at the American Epilepsy Society. You'll understand, I hope, that I can't present that here. That's, um, that's not, my, uh, not within my gift. So uh, what I'm doing here with permission from um, the um, investigative panel uh, in the US is to present what was presented at the American Academy. There were 137 children from the age of eight months up to 26 years um, who had at least three months continuous exposure. Um, 48 of them had at that time had gone on to 24 weeks and six months and beyond. And you'll appreciate that uh, in December, uh, provided the uh, abstract is accepted at the AES, uh, these data will be expanded substantially. Of those 137, there were 25 children with Drave, 22 with Lennox Gasto, but the most common diagnoses were unknown and other, which together comprised 40%, uh, and within which, of course, may lie uh, a number of PCPH19 cases. Um, very briefly, this is what we saw. Um, we, we, in the same way that Dr. Sullivan's um, described um, seizure frequency measured over 28-day periods or monthly periods, we did exactly the same. And I would concentrate on the three monthly periods up to week 12, because after week 12, the numbers are different and it's not strictly apples and apples, whereas all the same patients are included here and here and here. This is all seizures. I've not restricted this to convulsive, partial onset, uh, any subtype. So this is all seizures counted. Um, a 40% mean or median reduction in all seizures in all patients. But in Dravet syndrome children, you can see that that was actually better, quite a lot better. So um, a median reduction of 50% in those 25 Dravet syndrome patients. Uh, in the second month, that was better. And in the third month, that was better still, suggesting at least that there doesn't appear to be a drop off in the response. Expressed in a more kind of familiar European fashion where responder rates rather than uh, reductions in seizure frequency are, are perhaps looked at more with more interest. Um, this is uh, children who, is, who patients who achieve a better than 50% uh, reduction in seizure frequency. 40% uh, of them achieve that response overall uh, in all seizure types. Uh, again, that's better. It's more than 50% in month one, uh, 55 in month two, rising to about 57 in month three for the Dravet syndrome children. We look at atonic seizures, we're seeing a 65% reduction over the period with atonic seizures and 55% in children diagnosed with Lennox Gasto and their atonic seizures. So really, I think we felt able to conclude from that that there appears to be a, a response across a wide range of seizure types uh, and at relatively little safety penalty. 5% um, of patients over the total exposure here is 54 patient years. So it's similar to treating 54 patients continuously for a year. One in 20 of those will have withdrawn because of a side effect, which I think uh, testifies that it's being pretty well tolerated in this group of patients. Um, now, with special permission from uh, uh, Oren Davinsky in New York, um, he's permitted me to present these data. In New York only, okay, in New York only, um, uh, 
quality of life using a quality of life in uh, children with epilepsy uh, scale, QLCE scale, was done uh, at time zero and after 16 weeks. So this is data on 25 patients, and I've taken out the top performing domains of that quality of life, um, the 12 out of the uh, 16 domains presented here, and I've presented the ones which have the best response. None of them, none of them were negative, or none of them showed a negative change. They all showed a, a positive change, but the, I, I think I'd draw attention to the domains at the top. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, cognitive, quality of life, attention, concentration, language, and social interactions, where, where you can at least make a case from these data that something other than seizure frequency is being improved in these children. Uh, in short, that cognitive function is improving. And at last year's AES, Elizabeth Teal in Boston um, presented in her poster looking specifically at tuberous sclerosis, where of course impairment of cognitive function is a substantial uh, element of the condition. But on the right hand side, um, uh, she drew attention to the um, apparent separation in improvements in cognitive function and improvements in seizure frequency that she was seeing in her patients. So patients without a marked effect or a marked reduction of seizure frequency nonetheless were getting marked improvements in cognitive function. Um, I think I have two slides um, trying to pull the whole thing together. The mechanism of action of CBD is clearly not a single mechanism of action. It acts um, as quite a potent inhibitor of adenosine reuptake and it has been shown very clearly to reduce um, central nervous system inflammation through a mechanism dependent upon the A2A receptor and, if, and the literature that which tells you that adenosine might be an endogenous anti-seizure agent uh, attributes that to the, to the adenosine 1 receptor. So already we're looking at a, a potential diversity of effect. Um, GPR55 is an orphan receptor which, which is closely linked to calcium flux uh, and where CBD is an antagonist. VDAC1 is the voltage-dependent anion channel, which we've seen is upregulated in a phase one setting by CBD, and again is closely related to mitochondrial calcium flux. It sits on the uh, outer leaf of the mitochondrial membrane uh, and is upregulated by um, cannabidiol. So we're linking um, in, a, in a perhaps slightly fanciful and very um, circumstantial way, uh, a calcium-related uh, mechanism of action uh, through which CBD uh, may operate, perhaps to the calcium-dependent um, impact that uh, adherins have on um, cell membrane function. Um, my last slide, but one, uh, what are we doing in terms of clinical trials? Uh, we have two uh, randomized controlled trials in Dravé syndrome. Uh, the first one, including uh, just over 150 children, um, has concluded randomization and will have results at the end of January of 2016. Uh, the second study, uh, which is a dose-ranging study and includes an uh, additional cohort, so we'll, we'll have um, 150 patients in part. Uh, B is uh, nearly fully uh, randomized and will report about three months later. And two studies in Lennox-Gasto syndrome will report around about May-June of next year as well. So a very substantial body of placebo-controlled clinical trials data, CBD uses an add-on treatment to be reporting out next year. And of course, we will continue to get more information from these now, now at three, 350, but by next year up to 400 patients in this expanded access program in the United States. So my conclusions are uh, that CBD is effective in a range of animal models, that it appears to, at least the case is quite strong, that it has a an improvement or shows an improvement in cognitive function in animal models of epilepsy and animal models of cognitive dysfunction. Anecdotal evidence supports its use. Uh, that's confirmed with really a very substantial and professionally run expanded access program, uh, primarily in the United States, where we're seeing quality of life and cognitive function improvements. We'll have randomized controlled trials in more than 500 children in total, um, Dravet and Lennox Gasto. Uh, over the course of the next nine months or so, and we are looking at cognitive function and behavior and quality of life in those children. And we do have a follow-on compound with a, quite a similar pharmacology uh, in currently in phase two uh, as a proof of concept in partial onset seizures. So thank you very much for your attention, and thank you, Chairman. <laughs>